Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he's come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. I thank God again for another day of life and for this glorious honor and the privilege he has extended to me to speak on his behalf by declaring the words of life. And I truly and sincerely thank God for that. I thank him also for your continuing interest in the words of truth, which are the words of life, which are the words of freedom. For the Bible says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And of course, the very same chapter of John 8, verse 36, 32 says, ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Verse 36 says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So the truth that sets us free is actually Jesus Christ. He is in himself the living truth. He is in himself the way of life we should live. He is in himself the word. He is the way, the truth, and the life. May the Lord bless you again for your love of his word and for your love of him. I welcome you from whatever country where you are now. May God bless you, bless your country, bless your leaders. As always, I ask God to pour out a very special blessing on those watching who are not set of the Adventists, wherever you are. May the Lord super abundantly bless your lives and put a special blessing on your children, now and forevermore. Let me urge you, always pray for your leaders because they need the prayer of the brethren. Leadership is not easy. If you do not believe that, read the story of Moses, what hardships he went through. Pray for the leaders. They need that spiritual support. We got one question, and I will get to that question now before getting into the message. Let us pray for wisdom. Father in heaven, we come to you, dear God, in the name of Jesus, a name you always accept. In his name, we ask you first to forgive us our sins, cleanse us completely in his blood, and Father, grant us your spirit of truth. According to John 16, 13, it is he that guides us into truth. Guide us into truth now and grant to me the wisdom I need. Promised in James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And Father, I lack wisdom and I ask you for that wisdom. Grant it to me, not for my sake, but first for your glory and for the blessing of those listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The question is a very significant one. When God forgives, does forgiveness lift any curses that may be on our lives? When God forgives, does the forgiveness of God remove curses in our lives? The word cursed first appears in Genesis 3 verse 14. And unto the serpent he said, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. It first occurs because of sin. In Genesis 3, the same chapter, verse 17, God said to Adam, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. It also occurs in Genesis 4, after the sin of murder, where God said the ground would be cursed because of Cain's murder of his brother Abel. So curse is introduced because of sin. Let's make that very, very clear. Fundamental principle. Where there's no sin, a curse cannot abide. Now, there may be this very unpleasant reality 
that there is a curse on a family that has come down through the ages. It does not mean that you are responsible morally for what your great grandfather did, but it certainly means that you may be affected by what he has done. We see this principle in the second commandment, Exodus 20, reading from verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So we see the consequences of sin can affect generation and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The consequences of obedience can affect generations. But in either case, the generations are affected by the consequences, not because they have done anything particularly, but because of the behavior of prior generations. Having said that, if we look at Daniel chapter 9, now the Bible does not record Daniel having lived a sinful life. But as Daniel prayed in chapter 9, he said, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly, we have rebelled even by departing from your precepts and thy judgments. So Daniel associates himself with the sins of his forefathers and he confesses that. Nehemiah does the same thing. When he hears of the condition of Jerusalem, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to Artaxerxes. And when he heard of the conditions of Jerusalem, he said in verse 6 of chapter 1, Let now thy ear be attentive to the, and thy eyes open, that thou mayst hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have committed against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. Nehemiah said, I have sinned. My father, we are part of this sin. He includes himself with his people who have sinned. Daniel does the same thing. And having included himself with their sin, now he confesses that sin. What am I saying to you? If you believe there's a curse on you and your family, and you know the behavior of previous generations, you say, Father, I bring to you the sins of my previous generations. I confess them to you, dear God. This, in a certain sense, is a reflection of the way Jesus functioned. Jesus took our sins and confessed our sins. Not that he committed them, but he identified himself with us. He took our sins into himself. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the cross. And so Christ identified with our sins. He identified with us, having never sinned himself, and confessed those to the Father. Daniel identified himself with the sins of his forefathers and confessed that to God. Nehemiah identified himself with the sins of his forefathers and confessed that to God, and God responded in each case. If you think there's a curse on your family, find out what your family members did, your forefathers, if it's witchcraft, whatever it may be, and you confess that to God as if you had done it and see what God does. But where sin is removed, curses have to go. Galatians 3 verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. And so you can go to God in prayer and say to him, Father, I believe there's a curse on my family, but Jesus took upon himself all curses that can come upon a sinner. And in his name, I ask you, Father, forgive my family, forgive me, and remove that curse as Jesus took it and see what God does for you. So yes, forgiveness also includes deliverance from curses and anything related to curses. All right, we'll get our message now, which is entitled Spirit of the Living God. Our subject, Spirit of the Living God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask in the name of Jesus to be with us, Lord, as we discuss your word. Grant us wisdom from above, and that wisdom is given to us by your spirit. Give me simple language, dear Father, that your people may be enlightened, but even more so, you may be glorified in their lives. Bless everyone listening, every country represented, Father. Bless the leaders. Help them, as I always pray, to make decisions in the light of your word, which says, Righteousness exalteth the nation. Pour out a special blessing on all our non-7 the Adventist guests, I pray. 
Thank you for the honor of worshiping you. Thank you for freedom of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject, Spirit of the Living God. There is a belief among many Christians, and certainly in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, either there is no Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is energy or a force or something like electricity, but not an intelligent, separate personality as distinct from the Father as the Son is from the Father. Let me say that again. There are some who do not believe that the Spirit of God is a distinct and separate personality and a member of what is called the Trinity or the heavenly trio, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, before I go any further, we need to understand what the Bible says to those who speak disparagingly against the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 12, we read from verse 31. Matthew 12, verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoso speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoso speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. This is a very sobering statement. We're told that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit does not have forgiveness. You can blaspheme the Son and be forgiven. Blasphemy against the Holy Ghost does not carry forgiveness which means a person ought to be very, very careful what he or she says against the Holy Spirit. Of course, any confessed sin brings forgiveness. But blasphemy against the Holy Ghost brings a person to the place where he or she does not seek forgiveness. And so blasphemy against the Holy Ghost becomes unforgivable. Before looking at the Holy Spirit, let's take a look at God the Father. In Exodus 33, reading from verse uh, 18, Exodus 33, reading from verse 18, this is what the Bible says. And he said, show me thy glory. This is Moses. I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee and will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. God told Moses, no one can see the face of God. If we accept the simple reading of the Bible, God has a face. Let me say that again. If we accept the simple reading of the Bible, we have to accept the fact that God has a face. In verse 21, and he said, Behold, there is a place nearby me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, when my glory passeth before thee, or passeth by, thou shalt, I will put thee in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand. That's what God told Moses. I will cover thee with my hand when I pass by. Verse 22. Now we have God has a hand. Verse 23 says, And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. What these three verses tell us, Exodus 33, 21 to 23, it announces that the, that passage announces that God has a hand, God has a face, God has back parts, which Moses saw. God said, you will see my back. You cannot see my face. It's impossible to have a back if you don't have a front. And so God is giving us insights into the way he is, his, his form, his, his, his makeup, if I may use that expression carefully, because no one has actually seen the Father. If we go to John chapter 5, we'll read verse 37. John 5, verse 37. Here's what the Bible says. And the Father which have sent me hath borne witnesses me. He have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Now we're talking about the spirit of the living God. The Bible says he have not heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. Now we have two other things introduced. We have God has a voice. And Jesus said he has a shape. Now, if we combine Exodus 33, 21 to 23, where we discover God has a hand, he has back parts, and he has a face. 
Now we discover from John 5, 37, God has a voice and God has a shape. Putting these five items of information together, the astonishing conclusion is that God to some degree looks like us. It perhaps is not as astonishing as I suggest because the Bible says, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image. The servant of the Lord tells us man was to bear God's image both in outward resemblance and in character. Let me say that again. Man was to bear God's image both in outward resemblance and in character. Somehow, when Adam was made, Adam looked like God. We've discovered, as I said, God has a face, God has a hands, God has back parts, God has a voice, God has a shape. We know the Bible gives us much information about the emotional side of God. God is angry. God is pleased. God is forgiving. God is long-suffering. God is merciful. God is good. God observes everything going on in the universe. Now, putting all of that together, surely we have an intelligent being, and no one ever argues the fact that God is an intelligent being. The controversy is usually focused on the Son and on the Holy Spirit. Now, if God is an intelligent being with emotions and a face, and the Bible suggests hands, and a back part, which means a front part, if Jesus says he has a shape, shape he has features and he is he knows everything now how can a god like that who is intelligent has an emotional structure how can he have a spirit that is not intelligent an intelligent god cannot have a spirit that is electricity because electricity is not intelligent an intelligent god cannot have a spirit that is force or just energy an intelligent god must have an intelligent spirit or the spirit does not properly represent god in the first corinthians chapter 2 we read from verse 9 but as it is written i have not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god hath prepared for them that love him but god hath revealed them to us by his spirit for the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of God. The Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. We know from Job 11 verse 7, the Bible says, canst thou by searching find out God? In other words, no human being, no limited created being can fully understand God, and that includes the angels. I repeat, no limited being can fully understand the depth of God's mind. And we saw that yesterday when we read the first Peter chapter one, verse 12, that the angels desire to look into the mysteries of the gospel. They do not fully understand. We also read from Ephesians three, verse 10, that it is the working of God through the church that allows the, the, the angels to understand to some degree how the plan of salvation works. Angels do not understand everything, despite the fact that they are vastly superior in their minds to us. Anyone who understands the depth of the mind of God must be himself divine. And so the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10, But God hath revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things. What are these all things? Yea, the deep things of God. The Bible informs us that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, knows everything that God knows. In order to know everything God knows, that person has to be fully divine, has to be equal with God. Let's take another look at the Holy Spirit to see him as an intelligent being, not just impersonal force. Before I go any further, let me pray. Father in heaven, continue to be with me as I deal with the Holy Spirit. And few subjects can be more significant than that of the Holy Spirit. Give me your words, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Acts, chapter 13, we'll read from verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain apostles and prophets as Barnabas, and Simeon, that is called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manes, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
as they ministered the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, or the Holy Spirit said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Again, use the Bible principle or the, the principle of Bible study. Take the plain, simple, obvious meaning of the word that jumps out at you when you read it. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, the Holy Ghost can speak. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Now, the Holy Ghost can discriminate. There was something about Barnabas and Saul that the Holy Ghost needed, which he did not perhaps see in the others who were there, uh, Lucius and Simeon and Manaeus. He saw in Barnabas and Saul precisely what he wanted for a particular mission. Verse 3, so when they had prayed and when they had prayed and fasted and laid their hands on them they sent them forth and they being sent sent forth by the holy ghost departed to Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to cyprus they being sent forth by the holy ghost the holy ghost sent barnabas and saul who became paul on an evangelistic mission and he chose them he discriminated i want these two for this mission of course he used the others as well but for this particular mission i want these two and the holy spirit must have known the, the temperament the personality the talents they had because all spiritual talents are brought to us by the spirit here we have the, the Spirit of God making an intelligent decision and choice. Here we have the Spirit of God discriminating among a gathering of people. An intelligent being alone can do that. And so as God the Father is intelligent and has a personality and has an emotional structure and according to the Bible has a shape, that's what Jesus said in John 5, 37 and has a voice, Jesus said in John 5, 37. Of course, we heard the voice of God when Christ came out of the watery, uh, the waters of baptism at the River Jordan in Matthew 3, uh, verse 17. The voice of the Father was heard from Exodus 3, 20, Exodus 33, 21 to 23. God has a hand, God has a face, God has back parts. And from there, we can make other safe assumptions about God. I'm stressing the fact that God is an intelligent personality with a mind full of knowledge. He has emotions. And if he has a spirit, that spirit has to reflect precisely the same thing. The spirit of a lion cannot be a hyena. The spirit of an elephant cannot be a worm. The spirit of an elephant must be an elephant. The spirit of God must be divine and must itself be God. Let's take another look at the Spirit of God. Let us go to Isaiah 45. We read verse 22. Isaiah 45, reading verse 22. The Bible says, Look unto me, and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else, there is none other. In other words, only God, I alone, says God, can save. Look unto me, and be saved all the ends of the earth whether from the north south east or west the orient the occident whether you you're, you're white you're black it makes no difference salvation can only be accomplished by god now only god can save. keep this in mind let us go now to john chapter 3 we shall read verse 8. listen to jesus the wind bloweth where it listeth and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. When Jesus says born of the Spirit, he is referring to the new birth. The new birth is the same thing as justification by faith, or righteousness by faith, or forgiveness, or transformation. When that publican walked up into the temple, Luke 18, and he said, God be merciful to me, a sinner, Jesus said in verse 14 of Luke 18, this man went down to his house justified. In other words, he, he experienced a new birth. He was made clean. He was cleansed. He experienced justification by faith. Jesus says this is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. This is how people are saved. Now, Isaiah 45, 22 tells us, look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Only God can save. And if Jesus says we are justified, the new birth is by the work of the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Spirit then must be divine, must be fully God in order for him to save and bring about that work of transformation in the life called the new birth. This is the obvious teaching of John 3, verse 8, when combined with Isaiah 45, verse 22. If the Holy Spirit is the one who brings about conversion, then this Holy Spirit of God must himself be God. When I say the Holy Spirit is God, I am not saying the Holy Spirit is the Father. There are three separate personalities, but each one is fully divine. Let me say that again. There are three separate personalities. Each one is fully divine. In Matthew 3, 16, 17, which records the baptism of Jesus, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. Now we have Christ spatially, physically located in that, that river of Jordan. And lo, the heavens were open and open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now we have the Spirit placed physically in a certain position, or he places himself. We have Christ physically placed in water. We have this dove physically placed on the shoulder of Jesus Christ. We have two distinct entities, one standing in water, one sitting on the shoulder of the one standing in water. Then we have a literal voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We have three locations, the water, the shoulder, and heaven. In the water, Jesus. On his shoulder, the spirit in the form of a dove. In Acts chapter 2, he came in the form of cloven tongues of fire. The spirit of God can manifest himself anywhere he chooses. And that is not so impossible to believe because there are certain creatures in the sea, an octopus or a chameleon, they change their color based on the background that surrounds them. I say that again. There are certain octopi in the sea who can change their color based on their surrounding. The chameleons, some chameleons do that. And so if animals can do that, sure, the Holy Ghost can change the way he appears as he sees fit. The point I'm stressing is that we have clearly, on who reads honestly, Jesus standing in the water on the banks of the Jordan, the spirit in the form of a dove sitting on his shoulder and a distinct voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Our subject, spirit of the living God. In John 14, before I go any further, let me pray again. Father, continue to tell me what to say to your listening people, that your name may be glorified in their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John 14, reading from verse 16. Listen very closely, very microscopically. And I will pray to Father. What does that mean? I will pray to the Father. Then there must be two people. I will pray to to the Father, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now we have three persons, Jesus praying to the Father, and the Father sending the Holy Spirit. We have three, Jesus praying to the Father, and the Father sending the Holy Spirit. This is the very clear message of John 14, verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Here again, we have three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In the book Evangelism, in chapter 148, Misrepresentations about the Godhead, the servant of the Lord tells us that the three are referred to as the heavenly three -o, and in their names we are baptized. The heavenly three -o, in their names we are baptized. She also says on page 616, uh, paragraph 6, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit has a personality. This is from the writings of the servant of the Lord, Ellen White, in the book Evangelism. The Spirit of God is an intelligent being. If we go back to Isaiah chapter 46, we'll read verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there's none else. I am God, there's none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. 
Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. Sounds similar to Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. As God alone can save, so God alone knows the end from the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Now, we know from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11, that it was the spirit of Christ in the prophets that told them and taught them what they ought to write. And they wrote about things to come thousands of years before they occurred. First Peter chapter 1, verse 11. The spirit of Christ was in them. The very first prophet identified in the Bible is Enoch. Enoch was a prophet. What he prophesied is found not in Genesis, but in the second last book of the Bible, Jude. In the book of Jude, from verse 14, and Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all the ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. Jude 14 and 15. Now, if you look at that verse carefully, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Now, keep in mind, Enoch was alive when Adam was alive. Enoch and Adam lived together for many, many years. That tells you how far back Enoch goes and how early the preaching of the second of coming of Christ was proclaimed. This means that thousands of years before Jesus actually came, maybe 3,000 and more, Enoch prophesied that Christ would come. But the coming of Christ referred to in, Enoch, in Jude chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 is not the coming of Christ as a baby because he did not come with 10,000 of his saints as Jude 14 tells us. That must refer to the second coming and the third coming because the Bible talks of three comings of Christ. When he came as a baby, when he comes a second time, when he comes a third time after the thousand years. Enoch is referring to events that will occur at the second and the third coming of Jesus Christ. Now, how could he know that the Spirit of God revealed to him? And how could the Spirit of God know that? Because the Spirit of God is God himself. He knows the end from the beginning as the Father knows the end from the beginning. The Spirit of God can save. It is He through the Word that accomplishes the work of conversion or the new birth. Only a God can save. And it is the Spirit. Also, only God can create, by the way. Only God can create. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1. Psalm 33, verse 6, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. The Hebrew word for create in the Bible is applied only to God. Only God can create. We know from the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The spirit of God was involved in creation psalm 104 verse uh, 29 and 30 now send this forth thy spirit they are created the spirit is involved in creation physical creation and the spiritual creation when the bible when david said created me a clean heart of god that is accomplished by the spirit spiritually as verily as he had a role in physical creation. Yes, Christ is the central figure of creation, but the Father and the Spirit were involved. Only a divine being can be involved in creation. A human being cannot create. An angel cannot create. A human being can manipulate what God has created. We can take materials and make a beautiful building or build a bridge or whatever. But only God can create. And if the Holy Spirit was involved in creation, surely the Holy Spirit is a divine being. What have we said so far? An intelligent God must have an intelligent spirit. An intelligent God cannot have a non-intelligent spirit. God is a personal God. A personal God must have a personal spirit. An emotional God must have an emotional spirit. Emotional in the sense is the Holy Spirit has emotions as well. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, God cannot be who he is 
and have a spirit different from him. As I said earlier, an elephant cannot have the spirit of a hyena, nor can an eagle have the spirit of a worm. The spirit must be a reflection of God the Father, and the spirit is also a reflection of Jesus, because he is called both the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. We see that in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. This Holy Spirit is called both the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 11, we read that the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify it was the Spirit of Christ that instructed the Old Testament prophets as they wrote those books, also instructed the New Testament writers. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are one and the same person, because Christ is just like the Father. I and my Father are one. It does not mean that Christ is the Father. They are separate beings, but they are alike. The Spirit of Christ is also called the Spirit of God, and he represents both. That is why in John 14, 26, Jesus says, I, the, the Father, will send the Spirit. In John 15, 26, Jesus says, I will send the Spirit. Both the Father and the Son can send the Spirit. My brothers and sisters, let me remind you of the, uh, the respectful warning I gave at the beginning of this message. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, why did Jesus feel the need to say that? Because earlier in that chapter, the Pharisees accused Christ of casting out demons using the power of the devil. This was a tremendously serious charge. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, verse 24, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. They accused the Son of God of using satanic power to perform a miracle. This was an accusation against the Holy Ghost, not just against Jesus. Why is that? Because in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, the Bible said how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. How did Jesus heal those who were oppressed of the devil? By the power of the Holy Ghost, Acts 10, 38. I hope that is sinking in. Acts 10.38 tells us that Jesus performed his miracles by the power of the Holy Ghost. In his humanity, Christ was used by the Holy Spirit. When Christ delivered that demon-possessed man in Matthew 12.22, which says, Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Matthew 12.22.23. That miracle was performed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 24 says, when the Pharisees saw it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. This is the idle word to which Jesus refers to when he says in verse 36, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the judgment. That was the idle word, that the miracles of God are performed by the power of the devil. This was a blasphemous statement against the Spirit of God. That's why Jesus said in verse 31, 32, if you blaspheme the Spirit of God, there is no forgiveness because a person that bold does not feel the need to say, I'm sorry. And consequently, there is no forgiveness. And so I remind us of that passage as we conclude this brief discussion, which can go on for hours, about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a distinct personality. And because he knows everything God knows, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10, he must be equal with the Father in divinity. Because he is also the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of the Father, he must be divine. Because he knows the end from the beginning, he must be divine. Because he was involved in creation, he must be divine. Because he saves, John 3 verse 8, he must be be defined. Because he selected Barnabas and Saul from a group of five and possibly more people, he must be intelligent to discriminate one person from another based on that person's gifts and abilities. The Spirit of God is an intelligent being. And by the way, listen again to Romans 8 verse 9. It is just as solemn as Matthew 12, 31, 32. But ye are not in the flesh, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. 
Now, if any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If you say the spirit of God does not exist, the Bible says, if the spirit of God is not in you, you are not a child of God. If any man hath not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. My prayer to you, my appeal to you, is that you ask God for the spirit to come into your life. Luke 7, verse 13. Luke 11, verse 13. If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Ask God for the Holy Spirit. But remember Acts 5, 32. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Obedience is a condition for receiving the Spirit of God. Asking for the Spirit, and we know from 1 John 5.14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Well, Jesus said the Father is eager to give us the Spirit. It is his will. Then by asking for the Spirit of God, we are asking according to the will of God. And when we do that, God answers. But remember, there's another condition. We must be willing to obey God. Spirit of the living God. God is an intelligent being. God has a shape according to Jesus. He has a form. He has hands. He has back parts. He has a face. He has, he's a, he, he, we were made in his image. So to some degree, God looks like us. No, we look like him, I should say. An intelligent God, he gets angry, he's compassionate, he's forgiving, he is sad. All of this tells us we have God is an emotional being. When I say emotional, I don't mean out of control. I mean, he has an emotional structure as far as the Bible tells us. Then his spirit must also be intelligent and have emotions. He's the spirit of God. He's the spirit of Christ. He can create, he can save. He knows the end from the beginning, and he knows everything the Father knows. And without his presence in your life, you cannot be identified as a child of God. Ask God, Father, grant me a portion of your spirit. God will do that. And as you receive that portion, the spirit now will direct you as to what you ought to do so that you may be more and more filled with the spirit of God. Ask God to grant you a measure of his spirit right now, that the spirit may enable you, enable you to live the life that God will have you to live. I thank God for the spirit of the living God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask in the name of Jesus, please take my message I delivered or your message through me and make it even clearer as people reflect and meditate on what they've heard. Hear this humble prayer, Father. Be merciful to all those listening. Remember those struggling with one sin or another. Give them the victory they God. Remind them that I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Father, remind them that you forgave all sins and cleanse from all iniquity. Bless again all the visitors they God. We thank you for their presence. Bless the countries represented by the audience, Father. Bless the leaders of those countries. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your patience. Save us when you come, Father. Without losing one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.